Let's talk about clauses in this video. And a clause is a major part of a sentence. It can also be a sentence by itself, uh, but we can also combine multiple clauses into a larger sentence. And the, the trick here is that we need always a subject and a verb. So as long as we have a subject and a verb, then we have a clause. And we can add some extra information as well, as we'll see. But these two things are really essential. Now, there are two kinds of clauses. There are independent clauses, clauses that can stand by themselves as a complete sentence. And there are dependent clauses. We'll talk about both of these. So dependent clauses cannot be a sentence by themselves. We'll start with independent clauses here. So if you look at these examples, first one reads, Canada's Prime Minister likes taking selfies. And this one has a verb. It has a subject who is doing the action. And then it has some extra stuff. In this case, we have a direct object. And we have an object complement in selfies. OK, so that's the first one. The second one reads, the 2017 Super Bowl remains one of the most spectacular comebacks in sports history. So here again, we have a main verb. And then if we ask who or what remains, we get to the 2017 Super Bowl. That's our subject. And then we have an object as well. Again, the direct object is not crucial. It's just, it's just the case that these two sentences follow this pattern. And then this one ends with a couple of prepositional phrases, which I'm going to put in brackets because they're not really essential. So we have of, there's our preposition, the most spectacular comebacks, that's the uh, object of the preposition. And then our second prep, uh, prepositional phrase is in sports history. And in is the preposition, and sports history is, th is the object of the preposition. So as you can see, you can have quite a lengthy uh, clause, but not all of it is essential. And so you have to kind of make sure you separate the clauses from the phrases. And we'll have a separate video about phrases uh, to get at the core of what the clause actually is. Next, we'll have a look at dependent clauses. So if we look at this example here, it says, if you visit the Coromandel Peninsula, you should go to Hot Water Beach. All right, so the first part here, if you go or if you visit the Coromandel Peninsula, this is a dependent clause. It still has a subject and a verb, so you visit. You is the subject, visit is the verb. But in this case, you could not have this as a complete sentence. And that's because of this conjunction, if. So if is a subordinating conjunction. Subordinating. And as a result of this, uh, the whole clause becomes dependent. The second clause is independent. You should go to Hot Water Beach. And you can hear that that can be a sentence by itself. So if you have a dependent clause, you always need to attach it to an independent clause. And you do that usually by means of a conjunction. We'll talk about one other way to do it as well in a moment. All right, uh, the next sentence here reads, I visited the Coromandel Peninsula, but I did not go to Hot Water Beach. Now, it sounds like the second one here is a dependent clause, but I did not go to Hot Water Beach. It cannot stand by itself as a complete sentence. But this is a little bit different here because but is a coordinating conjunction. And there are seven of these. You may remember the, the fan boys, right? And, but, nor, for, or, uh, so, and yet. And when you have a coordinating conjunction, you, you do not include it as part of the clause that it sort of goes with. So if you're trying to determine is this dependent or not, ignore it for determining if the clause is independent or dependent. So a coordinating conjunction often comes between two independent clauses, and we do not include it as part of this particular clause. I know that's a little bit confusing, but it's really crucial to determine if the clause is dependent or independent. The last thing we want to focus on here is these connecting words that tie the dependent clause to the main clause. So there are two kinds. There are subordinating conjunctions, and then there are also relative pronouns. And we haven't mentioned these quite so much. So when you have a relative pronoun and you use it at the beginning of a dependent clause, 
then that clause can be called a relative clause. Don't worry though, this is still very much a dependent clause. So if you want to call it a dependent clause, that's totally fine. But there's one thing to watch out for, and I'll show, show you this through an example. So let's say you want to say, or let's say uh, the sentence reads, I love Kim who appreciates who appreciates my knitting. Maybe you want your knitting skills to be loved by somebody. Okay, so we have love in the first part. This is the verb. I is the subject. And you can see that this first little bit is definitely an independent clause. It can be a complete sentence by itself. Kim is the direct object here. Then we start with our relative pronoun, and this one introduces a dependent clause. So this whole last part cannot stand by itself. But notice what's happened here. So we still have our verb, appreciates, but who is doing the appreciating? Well, it's who. So the subject here is the relative pronoun. And that's kind of unique about relative pronouns, that they are both the connecting word and often they're the subject as well. So that tends to confuse people quite often. And it's quite frequent that you start with this kind of short little independent clause, and the dependent clause can often be much longer. So don't go by length. It's really the function that determines which kind of clause you're dealing with. So that's it for clauses, dependent and independent. And try to do the exercises on the website to get better at distinguishing them.